Welcome to Calvary Chapel, North Whittier. We're glad you're here with us today. This message was recorded at Calvary Chapel, North Whittier, given by Senior Pastor Charlie Barbosa. It is our hope that this message is a blessing to you and your daily walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. But so today, we're going to veer off a little bit, of course, from 1 Corinthians, to talk a little bit about what's something that's very relevant, something that's been going on within our nation, and that is the most uh, recent election and the conversations that are happening all over the place regarding um, where we're at as a nation and where we're headed. And uh, even before the election, um, it had been on my heart and my prayer for our church and for our country and for the church in general, for you know, the, the Lord's church, not to get... Uh, distracted or divided um, by the politics of uh, what's happening. And so today, if you would, I believe I have a word from the Lord uh, regarding this issue. And uh, su- suffice it to say this, God's not a Democrat or a Republican. But He is a Savior. And His desire is to save Democrats and Republicans and independence, and non-partisans. The Lord's desire is to save, and the good news is He's not checking your voter registration card. He's not checking how you voted. He looks at your heart. So today, I want to I share with you something. I hope you receive this as from the Lord, but it's also the word of the Lord. So turn to Daniel chapter 9. We'll get there in a few moments, but... Um, I want to set the setting for you. Um, in Daniel chapter 9, we see Israel come just ready to come out of bondage. They had been in bondage for 70 years in Babylon. And it was because of the judgment of the Lord. The judgment of the Lord came upon his own people, came upon the people that he loved, the, the, the nation that he gave birth to, but he had to judge them for their constant idolatry, the constant worshiping of other gods, and not following his commands. We've talked about that in other Bible studies. The nation of Israel had turned their backs on the very God who gave them existence. So we find Daniel here in Daniel chapter 9, a man, a prophet of God, A man who had been in Babylon all these 70 years. So Daniel is about 86 years old or so at this time. So all he's he's really ever known most of his life, especially all of his adult life, was captivity in Babylon. But during this time, it wasn't wasted for Daniel. He's been reading the Bible. He's been reading the scrolls, the ancient manuscripts of Jeremiah and Isaiah. And as a result of reading the Word of God, again, just these ancient scrolls, it wasn't the Bible as we know it today that he was reading, that wasn't put together yet. But as a result of reading the prophecies and of praying to the Lord, he realizes the time of the captivity and the judgment of the Lord in Babylon is just about over. The 70 years that they had, that they had their time they had to pay in judgment is, is now coming to an end. During the time of the Babylonian captivity, captivity, the Persians, the Persians took over Babylon, and King Cyrus reigned over um, over Israel as they were in captivity there. And Daniel, knowing the prophecies of Isaiah 250 years earlier, Isaiah had prophesied that there would be a deliverance among the people, that they would be set free from a captive captivity in Babylon under King Cyrus. Man, King Cyrus wasn't even born yet. This is 250 years before, yet he is named in Scripture. That's amazing prophecy. Pinpoint accuracy, right? So, there happens to be a transfer of power 
in Babylon now, per, oh, not, now, now taken over by King Cyrus and the Persians. And as, as the time is coming for the release of Israel to be free, no doubt there's great concern. What's this going to happen? What does it mean now that now that Babylonian isn't reigning over us, and now it's the Persians? Is this still going to happen? Things were about to change for Israel. But in the midst of all that, they're thinking, what is God doing? Can you imagine? I mean, they came under the Babylonians, and now they're under the Persians, and under Cyrus, and a totally different king. But is the promise still good? Is it still valid? Are we still going to be released? It's been 70 years. What is God doing? So Daniel, knowing these things, according to his readings and his prayers to the Lord, it's a critical time in the nation of Israel. It's a critical time for them to hear the word of the Lord, to be free from their captivity. What does Daniel do? We find him in Daniel chapter 9, praying to the Lord. What was Daniel's response to this nation at a crossroads, at a critical time in their history? He was in the Word. He, was, he knew the Word. He was in prayer, and he's seeking the Lord for direction. Guys, that must be our response as Christians during this critical time in our history as a nation. Fast forward to today in our beloved United States of America, in this country which we all love and give thanks for. We have so many similarities to Israel, our country, so, so many parallels. We're a nation founded on biblical values, on the Jewish scriptures. A small tag, ragtag group of revolutionary farmers desiring freedom to worship God and raise their families accordingly. And when you look at our history from the Revolutionary War and the, just the, the formation of our country and the great blessings and providence of God. You can't but have to say that it was God's very hand that formed our nation. Mm -hmm. A great miraculous victory over the British Empire, the greatest army known at that time. I want you to listen to some of these quotes from our nation's father, President General George Washington. Listen to these quotes. They're powerful quotes. The man must be bad indeed who can look upon the events of the American Revolution without feeling the warmest gratitude towards the great author of the universe whose divine interposition was frequently manifested on our behalf. Another quote. May the same wonder-working deity who long since delivering the Hebrews from the Egyptian oppressors planted them in the promised land whose providential agency has lately been conspicuous in establishing these United States as an independent nation still to continue to water them with the dews of heaven to make the inhabitants of every denomination participate in the temporal and spiritual blessings of that people whose God is Jehovah. Mm. Sounds like a preacher. Hmm? Mm. And lastly, glorious indeed has been our contest. Glorious if we consider the prize for which we have contended and the glorious in its issue but in the midst of our joys, I hope we shall not forget that to divine providence is to be ascribed the glory and the praise. Giving praise where praise is due. Reminds you of 
what God did for Israel. Just as George Washington said, the, the parting of the Red Seas, the feeding of manna in the wilderness, the sandals not wearing out of the Jews traveling those 40 years. They had escaped captivity and bondage in Israel. They too were just farmers, barely forming a nation. God gave them water from a rock. He gave them victories over ancient armies who had been in the land for millennia. And here comes this, this group of farmers, barely been formed as a nation, and, and they go and they, they take over the land of these armies who had been there for thousands of years. Sounds very much like the American story, doesn't it? Same God, same precepts. Beloved, oh how God will bless a nation. How God will bless a people who bless God. And it's so sad to see how far that we've come from even the speeches that I just read to you from our first president. And yes, our very nation of the United States of America has, has gone astray, just like Israel has gone astray, turning away from the great foundation that has been built, that has made our country the country that it is. And it can't go without saying, we've forsaken our history. We've forsaken our foundation. Taking God out of the public square. Taking God in prayer out of the schools when, when, when the very word of God was the first school book. Killing babies by the millions. The redefinition of, of marriage. Never mind the politics of it all. You can disagree with the politics. There's, there's plenty of room to disagree. But you can't disagree with the commandments of God. You don't want to find yourself on the other side of the commandments of God. We don't want to find ourselves there. It's, it's thus saith the Lord. We don't want to be on the wrong side of God as a nation. And we're drifting in that, towards that, system. In Jude 21, now keep in mind, Jude is a beautiful warning to Israel and to the, and to the Christians. It's that one chapter book in the Bible. That's why you, you won't hear somebody say Jude chapter, it's usually just Jude and then the verse, Jude 21. First book before Revelation. And he says simply, Keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in love. And that's not saying, you know, you have to be good enough for God to love you. So just, just do good and God will love you. Keep yourself in the love of God. Be so sweet, be so kind, and God will, God will love you. That's not what it means. What it means is keep yourself in the place of blessing. Don't allow yourself or your life to drift away from the blessing of God. That's what he's talking about. Keep yourself in God's love. God loves you. He wants to manifest his love. He wants to pour out his love upon you. By showing you his goodness and his mercy and his grace. Like any good father, our Heavenly Father wants to pour out His love upon His children. He wants to give His children gifts and blessings and good things. But also, like any good father, He disciplines His child. Mijo, don't go in the streets. Right? Mijo, mija, don't do that. It's dangerous. And then don't touch the stove. And what happens as soon as you say stove, 
Where is it? Start touching the stove. Start touching the iron. Start playing with the back of the car. Why? Because dad's mean? Because mom's mean? Or because he don't want you to get burned? And so to the Lord, the Bible says he, he loves those that he chastises. Let me come back over here, Mule. As we look at our country today, we see great unrest, great lawlessness. Things that we've really never seen in a lifetime. For sure. At least in my lifetime. Great division. And the, that glory has faded from the shining city on a hill. I believe we have failed to keep ourselves in the love of God as a country. I want to quickly go to Daniel's prayer. As Daniel is realizing where Israel is at in their situation, let's, I, want you, I want to look quickly at Daniel chapter 9, starting at verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Azarus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord, through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. That I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Basically, like we just said earlier, he's, he, he read the Bible, he read the books, he read, he read according to Jeremiah and Isaiah, the times of, of the number of Israel was up uh, as far as their release from captivity. Verse 4, And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession, I said, Lord, and I said, Oh Lord, how great and awesome God, who keeps His covenant and mercy with those who love Him, and with those who keep His commandments. Right here, here you go. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from Your precepts and Your judgments. Neither have we heeded Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, our princes, to our fathers and to all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, shame of face, as it is this day, to the men of all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs shame of face to our kings and princes and our fathers because we have sinned against you. So Daniel, recognizing the sins of Israel and he's confessing to God, repenting to God, we blew it. And he does that with prayer and with fasting. Look at verse 9. And to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. This is a wonderful, marvelous thing about God. Is that over and over and over and over and over again, he forgives. He's gracious. He's merciful. Verse 10 and 11. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in His laws which He set before us by His servants, the prophets. Sound familiar? Is our nation obeying the voice of the Lord? Verse 11, yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. Daniel, as a leader in Israel, Daniel, as a prophet of God, as a man of God, 
puts the blame where the blame belongs on the people. On the failure to follow God's precepts. God is righteous. God is forgiving. God is faithful. But the United States of America must acknowledge, confess, and repent from our national sins. Before we can once again have the peace and the blessing of God. Proverbs 14 verse 34 simply says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. When you look back at our early formation as a nation, small and ragtag for sure. We were the underdog for sure. But it was that righteousness that our very foundation was founded on and the precepts of God that God exalted the United States of America to today the greatest nation on earth. I believe it with all my heart. But sin has become a reproach. Our very successes, just like Israel, have become our failures. Daniel 9.12, he says, goes on, And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us great, a great disaster. God forbid. A great disaster. Under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Jerusalem, the very heart of God. The, the, the God that loved his people so much that he loved them enough to bring disaster and death to their country so that they would realize that the Lord Jehovah was God. As a result, they continue to reject today and because he loves them and as a result of their love, of his love for them, there's going to come a time that Jesus says is the worst time on the face of, that will be the worst time on the face of the earth. We've, been, we've looked at it a little bit before. Seven years of great tribulation to deal with the Jews and the, those that reject Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's mad at them? Not necessarily. Because he wants to save them. Once again, so great disaster is coming to come, going to come upon this world. And it will come upon this nation if we don't repent and have a national revival. Mm -hmm. God confirms his word. Israel had been warned. The United States has been warned by prophets, by the law, and yet we fail to follow. In our nation, our national model, motto is in God we trust. Mm -hmm. um, our monuments are embedded with scripture. Yeah. Yeah. I've never had the opportunity to go, but I hear when you go to Washington, it's a very spiritual moment. As you see everywhere on the monuments carved in stone, scripture that our nation was founded upon. Our nation knows we have a foundation of the word of God, just as Israel. And we look around at our dominance in the world, the greatest military on earth. And we look around at our advancements that we take not, take, uh, technology and medical, the advancements that we have in our country. We have been blessed. But we, those very things that we look around, we look and say, hey, we're doing all right, man. We must be doing great. We think we're doing okay. 
Isn't that the same in our personal lives? We think we're doing okay, but oftentimes, you know, hey, well, you know, I, I got the new job, I got money in my bank account, I'm doing all right, lightning, has, lightning hasn't struck me yet. And, 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 and we think that God's delay is at us getting away with sin. And we mistake the patience and the grace and the mercy of God and continue to sin. What will it take for our nation to repent? What will it take for our leaders to bow down to God like Daniel? What will it take for our great nation and the people of it to confess our sins? How long Will, will we be headed to certain disaster? Because this nation is headed to great disaster unless we repent. It's in the Word. It's not my opinion. That's what God does and what God, what God allows because He loves. Because He loves. Verse 14 of Daniel Mind. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we, do not, though we have not obeyed his voice. So Daniel again, accepting the blame on, on the behalf of God's people. He exclaims the righteousness of God and confesses Israel's, Israel's sin. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from, you, from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are reproached to those around us. Now therefore, our God, Hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Understand that when Daniel is praying this prayer, he, he says, don't do it for us. <laughs> don't do it because we deserve this. For your sake. Because you are righteous. You are just. We are sinful. In other words, God, we're not praying, give us what we deserve. Don't pray that prayer. <laughs> None of us want what we deserve. But we want favor. We want grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. So he prays that confession and repentance for the Lord's sake, not his own. Because Israel didn't deserve it. The United States of America doesn't deserve it. Not after the killing of millions and millions of babies. Yeah, that is the issue. That is a huge issue. Not with me. With the heart of God. The giver and sustainer of life. Daniel prays because of your sake. Because you are good. Because you are righteous. Because you are perfect. Verse 18, he says, Oh my God, incline your ear to me. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Oh Lord, hear Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. And I believe that the United States of America has been called by the name of God. Right? We are his people. As I close this morning, I want to share with you 
1 Samuel chapter 8. You don't need to go there because I'm not going to get into it very much this morning for the sake of time. I wish I could. But there was a time in 1 Samuel chapter 8 that as Samuel grew old, he, was, he needed to hand the baton off to somebody to, to rule the nation of Israel. And so he gave it to his sons. You know how that goes, right? <laughs> and so he gave it to his sons. He put his sons on the payroll. He said, you guys are going to lead the nation of Israel. But they were bad guys. They were bad guys and they didn't rule righteously. And, and so Samuel being still alive, the people came to Samuel and said, hey, your sons are jerks. <laughs> They're idiots. They're not called to rule the people. They're just taking care of themselves. And the people exclaimed to Samuel in 1 Samuel 1 8. Sorry, 1 Samuel 8. They exclaimed to Samuel, We want a king like all the other nations. And Samuel was very displeased. Why? Because God wanted to rule to reign over the people, they were his people. God had protected them. God had brought them through. God had birthed them as a nation. He provided miraculously for them. He gave them great victories. And Samuel says, You want man to rule over you? We want a king like all the other nations. We want a king to rule over us. Look at this discussion that God and Samuel have in 1 Samuel 8, 6 through 8. I'll read it for you. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me. That I should not reign over them. And according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, and even to this day, with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Since before the election, and especially after, I've really been praying for our nation at the crossroads. I've really been praying for our churches. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for our families. For us not to be divided and distracted over what's happening right now in this election and what's to happen in the future. That's the enemy's ploy because if the church can become distracted, then we're not acting on the part of the Lord. Yes, we pray. We vote. We do our best to be a witness and a light. And yes, we are a part of that conversation. We must be as a church to be the light. But I want to remind you with all the events that are happening in this world and the events to come, the answer never lies in a man. Never. And it never will. Even going back to biblical times, we have learned that time after time after time, man is unfit to rule himself. That absolute power corrupts absolutely. It's a shame. It's a shame. We have learned throughout our history as a nation, as Israel has learned, that man is wicked and sinful. And yet we're, our country's divided over our leadership, over our king. I want that king. I want that king. Because truly, whoever leads our country leads the world. We understand that. And it's important. It is an important conversation. But it must never, 
overlaps the fact that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It must never override the fact and distract us from the fact that the way this nation is going to be saved is by people becoming saved and calling upon the name of the Lord and confessing Jesus Christ as King. That's how you save a nation. Don't be distracted by man's divisions. Don't go there. Let's not lose sight of what is going to bring true change, revival to this country. Real and lasting change. The truth and freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When George Washington became our first president under the new constitution of the United States, he said this at his inaugural, inaugural address, and I'll finish here. No people can be bound to acknowledge and adore the invisible hand which conducts the affairs of men more than the people of the United States. Every step by which they have advanced to the character of an independent nation seems to have been distinguished by some token providential agency. We ought to be no less persuaded that the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected upon a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. The first thing that we need in order to see change is to have God ruling on the throne of our hearts. Mm -hmm. Then he can rule upon the throne of our nation. But the people must repent. As Daniel did, then the, the leadership must repent. And that must be our resolve, is to preach the gospel. We can't change Washington before we change our neighbors, before we change ourselves. And the question is, is God reigning on the throne of my heart? Is he my king? Or am I living how I want to live and doing what I want to do? Or am I following his precepts? That's the first change. First change starts with me and you submitting to the Lord as our King, as our God. And then we preach that gospel to our friends and our families and our neighbors. And salvation comes and change starts and revival. I believe that the Lord wants to save the United States of America. And I believe he wants to do a revival. And I believe it's going to start with the church being the church. That's where our focus should be. Father, we come today to you today asking you to help us to keep our eyes on the prize. Help us to keep our eyes upon you. Help us to follow this example of Daniel to be in prayer, to be in the word, to be focused on the solution and the answer which is Jesus Christ. But even so, as the formation of our country, the, our forefathers got together and on bedrock foundation, Lord, they carved in stone scripture that would be the foundation of our country. Truly, Lord, we want to be a nation Again, that trust in its God. And we ask you, Lord, to reign upon the throne of our hearts. Forgive us, Lord, for going astray. For going after and seeking after things that are unpleasing to you, God. And we thank you for the fact that we know 
You are righteous, Lord, and it's not because of our sake, as Daniel prayed, it's for your sake. It's because you are good. You forgive. And you are willing still to forgive. It is not too late for the United States of America, as it is not too late for me and my brothers and my sisters to turn away from evil and turn to the good of our God. We pray that you would restore this land once again, bring revival to this land once again, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes upon you, our King of Kings. We exclaim today, God, that you are our King. You are our God. Reign on the throne of our hearts, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today at Calvary Chapel North Whittier. We would like to extend an invitation to come and join us at 554 Workman Mill Road in the North Whittier area. May the Lord richly bless you.